pass immediately on to Professor Paul Bacon from Waseda University, Tokyo. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. You asked us briefly to uh, reflect on successes, uh, uh, you know, positive potentials and doom and gloom, but unfortunately I think that the overwhelming message is that from a Japanese perspective it's all doom and gloom. It's very difficult to imagine uh, any kind of upside to this uh, from the Japanese point of view. Um, Japan has been deeply and vocally opposed to Brexit uh, from the outset. Uh, its messaging has been very clear and consistent uh, to this effect. Um, I personally have spoken to a wide and very representative cross-section of Japanese society, and I've yet to meet a single Japanese person who isn't utterly baffled uh, by this vote and by this decision. That includes talking to academics, diplomats, and all sorts of different people, uh, and my wife. Uh, so <laughs> Um, so this is potentially uh, bad news for the Japanese economy and for the, the British economy. Um, the Japanese trade with Japan is responsible, or thought to be responsible for, about 140,000 jobs uh, in the UK. There's about 1,000 companies that this would affect. Uh, roughly half of Japanese direct investment in the EU uh, goes through uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, many Japanese companies use the e <coughs> use the UK as a gateway to Europe, uh, including, most famously, perhaps Toyota and Nissan. And so this would therefore be a very serious disruption indeed to the entire uh, Japanese business model for engaging with, uh, doing business with Europe and with the UK. Uh, I would say that in the medium to long term, uh, there, there is a very significant likelihood of uh, job cuts, relocation of production uh, in the event of a harder Brexit. So for the time being, Toyota and Nissan have both uh, declared that the next production cycles are likely to remain in the UK, partly because they have to make time-sensitive decisions. <coughs> but what they've also done in those statements, if you decode them and if you look at them quite carefully, what they've also very clearly said is, well, we'll review this on a hard -nosed from a hard-nosed business perspective on a case-by-case -case basis. And if the basis for those decisions changes, uh, then between the lines, yeah, we might very well uh, relocate uh, in the medium uh, to longer term. Also, uh, some of you may know that Japan uh, issued uh, a message to the UK and the EU, uh, a 15-page document with 18 very concrete points of advice uh, for the UK and the EU over Brexit. Uh, quite strongly worded, uh, not very coded appeal for a soft Brexit, uh, which maintains existing level, levels of market access and also calls very clearly for a transitional period. So it's highly unusual for any country to make such a public sort of diplomatic statement to the UK. But from a Japanese perspective, this is way out of the ballpark. It's deeply, deeply unusual for Japan to do this. And it shows you know, how important these issues uh, are for Japan. And I think Sir Michael just made this point about multilateralism and how that relates to New Zealand's self-identity and its best strategy for engaging with the world. Uh, Japan is also very, very deeply, at a political level, uh, committed to the G7 liberal vision of world order. And so anything that undermines that is very undermining for Japan. So as you say, it potentially weakens the EU, makes it more inward looking. There are all sorts of economic uh, repercussions for the entire Japanese mo business model for engaging uh, with Europe as well. So this is uh, incredibly damaging. Also, this declaration was made uh, in the middle of a G20 summit in China. So it was very, very clear diplomatic signal from that point of view. The Japanese wanted to embarrass Theresa May uh, in China uh, in the context of people talking about the alternative uh, vision of world order. <clears throat> so six minutes is really not very much time at all. So it's a good job I'm self-monitoring on the iPad. So. Um, so let me say, I mean, just there are various different possibilities for Brexit, uh, ranging from no Brexit uh, to a white Brexit, which is a kind of a Norway vision. These are some of the terms that May herself used when she talked about the idea of a red, white, and blue Brexit. Um, the white Brexit, which is a Norway uh, idea of uh, continued access to the single market. Uh, there's the black uh, Brexit, where is a custom, there's maintained access to the, uh, the customs union. Uh, there's the train crash uh, Brexit, uh, where we don't get a, a, a proper uh, deal in time. And this is what May was threatening uh, in her speech yesterday that they were prepared to take on the risk of a train crash Brexit if they weren't going to get what they wanted. And also, finally, we have the grey or the bespoke Brexit, where the, EU liked, where the UK likes to imagine that it can pick and mix 
uh, that it can limit uh, immigration, take back control of immigration, and cherry pick the sectors that it wants to sort of have sectoral agreements on. I think this is sort of tremendously optimistic, but this is the, the vision that the UK seems to have set out uh, this grey uh, Brexit option. So if we think about those categories, uh, Japan has a very strong preference in the following order for different types of Brexit. Uh, firstly, no Brexit at all. Uh, secondly, a white Brexit. Uh, thirdly, the grey uh, bespoke Brexit. Fourthly, the black. And then finally, uh, the train crash uh, would be the worst of all, uh, also for Japan. But I think, especially based on what May said yesterday, uh, the most likely outcome is a, some form of grey Brexit, but followed reasonably closely by the possibility of a train crash uh, Brexit as well, uh, unfortunately. But one last thing I'd like to say, I, I'm still in denial uh, about the prospect of um, Brexit happening at all. And one of the things that I was going to say to you today um, is that I thought the issue of uh, revocation, uh, there's a currently a legal challenge, and one of the many aspects of that is could the UK revoke Article 50 um, after it had triggered uh, the process. But actually May came out in point one of her speech yesterday and made a very, very clear commitment to the idea of having uh, a vote in both houses on the settlement when it comes through. So I'm, maybe I'm being far too optimistic, but I can still see a not so unrealistic scenario that in two years' time we have a terrible deal and that Parliament, there's some possibility that Parliament might, might vote it down. At the moment, that's unthinkable because of all the white heat and the anger and the Daily Mail led sort of uh, you know, witchcraft and so on. But two years down the line, with a terrible deal on the table, it might look a little bit different. But that may—I know that that might well be me being far too optimistic. Anyway. <laughs>